Today I'll be discussing our investigations into the acoustic feature that drives tonotopy. It's well established that tonotopy exists throughout the human auditory system, beginning in the cochlea where sounds are organized spatially in a high to low mapping of frequency content as you go from the base to the apex. And this spatial organization of frequency repeats throughout the auditory pathway. But what is also true is that processing further up in the hierarchy involves the extraction of more complex sound features like speech and music. In auditory cortex, tonotopy has a well-established V-shaped high to low to high gradient reversal mapping. So while it's clear that this tonotopy exists in cortex, what is less clear is whether this tonotopy is purely a reflection of frequency or whether the organizing principle gets converted into something higher level like pitch. The reason for this uncertainty is that there's an ambiguity that exists with the stimuli used to reveal these maps. Sounds that are traditionally used, pure tones for example, and even many natural sounds, co-vary in their fundamental frequency and their spectral content. In other words, both the pitch and the timbre of these sounds increase and decrease together. As such, it's unclear which acoustic feature is actually driving these maps. So the goal of this study was to disentangle these attributes. Here's a schematic of our stimulus manipulations with frequency content plotted on a log axis. So we're using harmonic complex tones. The red lines are the harmonics. Increasing or decreasing the spacing between these harmonics increases or decreases the fundamental frequency, which increases or decreases the pitch of the sound. And the amount of energy we give to the harmonics, the overall spectral content, is controlled by how we filter the sound, shown in blue. If we shift this envelope to the right, it shifts the peak of the envelope, which we'll refer to as the spectral centroid. This gives more energy to higher frequencies, resulting in a higher or brighter timbre per set. If we shift the envelope to the left, we're giving more energy to the lower frequencies, which results in a lower or duller timbre percept. And the key aspect here is that these attributes can be manipulated independently of one another. We used both pure tones and complex tones for our stimuli. Using pure tones served as our baseline of what tonotopy traditionally looks like. The complex tones consisted of timbre tones, which were varying in spectral centroid while the fundamental frequency was being held constant, and pitch tones, in which the fundamental frequency was varying and the spectral centroid was held constant. In all cases, there's a half octave spacing between the tones. We wanted to make the stimuli as salient as possible in a noisy scanner environment. In order to do this, we added a Morse code or techno-like rhythm to the stimulus sequence. We have tones of two different durations, 50 milliseconds and 200 milliseconds, and we pseudo-randomized their presentation to get this sort of techno beat that lasted roughly 8 seconds. Within this time, the same tone was presented, meaning the same pitch and timbre, just in varying durations. And then a new tone was presented for 8 seconds, and so on. Subjects were given a one-back task, in which they were instructed to indicate via a button box, if the current, current sequence step they were hearing was lower or higher than the previous step. So depending on what condition they were in, this would be a lower or higher pitch, a lower or higher timbre, or in the case of pure tones, it's both, so just a lower or higher frequency. And here's an example of what this sounds like. Here are pure tones. And that's a step down in frequency. Here are some timbre tones. And that went to a lower or duller timbre. And here's pitch. And that was a big drop in pitch. We 
We had 10 right-handed normal hearing subjects, and data were acquired at the 7T at a resolution of about 1 millimeter. And this was a continuous acquisition sequence. The slices were angled along the sylvian fissure to get coverage of the auditory cortices, as you can see in this image. Each run was about 6 minutes long, and there were 12 runs. We acquired several field maps for distortion correction, and we also collected 6T1s and 3T2s for segmentation and cortical reconstruction and myelin mapping, which helped inform our re regions of interest. This is a correlation matrix for a single subject that shows correlations between response patterns elicited by different stimuli in our experiment. Each little square is the correlation for the responses across a bunch of voxels, and there's a correlation value for each tone in each condition. The higher the correlation, the more similar the representation. The black lines separate the pure tones, pitch, and timbre conditions. You'll notice that in the pure tones, there's a diagonal pattern emerging, indicating that nearby frequencies have more similar response patterns. And with timbre tones, a similar diagonal pattern is emerging. And this diagonal pattern also appears when looking at the correlations between timbre and pure tone conditions. So low pure tones and low timbres are more strongly correlated with one another, and high pure tones and high timbres are also more strongly correlated with one another. The pitch tones, on the other hand, are all highly correlated with one another. And the correlation between pure tones and pitch is more of a step function, where pitch is only strongly correlated with high pure tones. This is likely due to the fact that all pitch conditions have a high spectral centroid. The stronger similarity between pure tone and timbre activity patterns suggests tonotopy is more likely a map of spectral content than fundamental frequency. And here's a group level matrix that looks very similar. We wanted to use encoding models to explore the topographic representations of pure tones, fundamental frequency, and spectral centroid. We started with a three parameter feature tuning model, which has the gain or height of the Gaussian, the center frequency, and the standard deviation or the fatness of the Gaussian. F is what we're feeding into the model either fundamental frequency, spectral centroid, or the pure tone frequency value. So it's kind of three models in one since we have to fit each condition separately. We'll start by looking at a single voxel for a single subject and compare the model fit to the data. On the y-axis we have the response, and on the x-axis we have the tones, ordered from low to high for each condition. The colorful lines are the data, and the black line in each plot is the fit. As you can see, the model is doing a pretty good job of fitting the data. What you might also notice is that the tuning looks stronger for the pure tones and the timbre than for pitch, at least for this voxel. Now let's look at a whole bunch of voxels. On the left panel is the data for 1,000 voxels, and on the right panel is the model fit. The rows are the voxels, and the columns are the different tones, order ordered by center frequency going from low to high. The aim of this visualization is to see how closely the left and right panels align, or how similar the data is to the fit across 1000 voxels. And we can do this for timbre up top and pitch down on the bottom conditions as well. The takeaway here is that the model seems to be doing a pretty good job given how similar the data and the fit are. Now let's look at the center frequency parameter for the pure tones on an inflated brain within our region of, region of interest. And let's zoom in. As a reference point, I have the Heschel's gyrus outlined in each hemisphere, denoting roughly where the primary auditory cortices are. As you can see, this follows the high to low to high gradient reversal of traditional tonotopy. If you're not accustomed to looking at tonotopy maps, if you find the big red patch in the middle, you'll see it's flanked by blue patches. That's the high to low to high mapping. There are other smaller reversals as well, which you might be noticing. These begin to become apparent on the individual subject level at high resolutions, but for now, we'll just focus on the main one. Here's another subject. Let's zoom in again. And here you'll notice the subject actually has two Heschel's gyri in each hemisphere, and the tonotopy is centered between the two. And I point this out to demonstrate how these maps can differ in their exact location and shape, 
but also to point out the consistency of this clear gradient reversal mapping, which we see in all of our subjects. Let's compare the pure tone maps to the center frequency parameter maps for timbre and pitch. To get a clearer picture, I'm now showing these on cortical spheres, which are no longer brain-shaped, but help give a better view of the maps. And for this subject, in all cases, we're seeing an indication of the high to low to high mapping. It's very clear for pure tones on the left, and in timbre up top, we're also seeing this gradient reversal. If you see those red patches flanked by the blue patches. And even for pitch down on the bottom, while it's a bit noisier, there is some indication of a gradient reversal structure as well, which is intriguing. Of course, just looking at the parameters doesn't give us a full picture of how well the model is doing for the conditions. So we'll look at the variance explained maps. We used cross-validation, and these are the R-squared maps for the test data. What you can see by eye is that the variance explained values appear to be higher for pure tones and timbre and less high for pitch. And the patchiness of the pitch R-squared maps is probably why we're seeing more noise in the center frequency maps for pitch. Next, to, to drive the point home that tonotopy seems to be driven by the spectral content, we made a modification to the model to create what we'll refer to as the spectral model. Instead of feeding in a single value for each condition, so a single frequency, the fundamental frequency, or the spectral centroid, we're now feeding in the entire spectrum. Since pitch and timbre conditions are complex tones, this seems appropriate. And for the pure tone condition, this model is effectively the same as the last one. But the nice thing about working with uh, the sound spectrum is that we can actually put all conditions into the model together. It's more of a sound computable model. I should point out that because the spectral envelope stays constant for the pitch condition, we did not anticipate this would be a good model for capturing response changes due to pitch variation. And here's what the center frequency model fit parameter looks like pooled across all conditions, shown on a sphere. And it looks quite similar to the pure tone center frequency maps we've been looking at. But we can also look at the maps of the center frequency parameter split into each condition separately to see how it compares to our earlier model. As expected, the pure tone map looks the same, and timbre is similar. As you can see, the red patch is still flanked by these greenish-bluish patches. But the hint of structure we were seeing in the pitch map down below has disappeared completely now. And here are the R-squared maps of the test data when the model is trained and tested on each condition separately. As you can see, pure tones and timbre are still looking pretty good, and the hot spots are in similar locations to one another. But the model is explaining basically no variance for the pitch condition. And as I mentioned, this isn't really surprising given that we are no longer using the fundamental frequency as an input into the model. So this suggests using the spectral content as input into the model works well for pure tones and timbre, but is not a good model for pitch variations. This again reinforces the idea that spectral content or frequency is indeed the attribute underlying traditional tonotopy. If we look at a single voxel, we can see that the model is doing pretty well fitting the pure tones and timbre, but essentially shows a flat line for pitch. Even if there is some sort of tuning for pitch, this model is not picking up on it. And here's the data and the fit across many voxels. On the left panel is the data, and the right panel is the fit. What we can see is that for pure tones and timbre, there's a low to high center frequency order that's being picked up on, and an indication of tuning. But for pitch, we don't really see evidence of this tuning. Voxels that are tuned to low frequencies are not responding to pitch at all, and voxels that are tuned to high frequencies are predicted to respond to all pitch stimuli roughly equally. Again, we're seeing a sort of step function, similar to what we were seeing in the representational similarity, similarity matrices earlier. So to sum this up, it seems that the frequency or spectral content is indeed the acoustic attribute driving traditional tonotopy maps. And the spectral model was a good model for both the pure tones and timbre, but was not sufficient for modeling response changes due to pitch variations. Lastly, the feature tuning model, which was the first encoding model we explored, describes the pure tones and timbre tones pretty well, and even provides some evidence that a pitch map, 
albeit a somewhat noisy one, may exist in a similar location as traditional tonotopy, so more exploration is definitely needed there. And with that, I thank you for your time.